Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. Today's video is about <sighs> training for bigger forms and better grip. And yeah, we left in my giggle for a reason. It's hilarious. So let's take a minute right now to get all the you know what kind of jokes, YouTube algorithm won't let me say the word, out of our heads by reciting a few. Um, mm -hmm. Noted. Now, on to the serious matter of getting super jacked forms. I sure hope they look a little jacked on camera. Who knows? All right. Two real topics in this video. One is how to get bigger forearms, and the other is how to get a better grip. Almost the same thing, but not quite. Forearm training first for hypertrophy. All the answers are really in the Hypertrophy Training Guide Central Hub on Renaissance Periodization. You can link right through to it in the description, no big deal. Has a whole enormous article on how to train your forearms, talking about frequency, volume, periodization, exercise selection, video instructional, all that stuff. And for a low, easy payment of completely free with no clickbait, sign up, anything, you can just have it right now. But as a quick summary, so really the hypertrophy part of this video is like, just go to the hypertrophy training hub central guide and it'll all be there. As a quick summary, here is a four point little situation. First, choose effective forearm exercises, mostly curling, not extension. Why? Well, when you want big calves, how many like, you know, calf extensions do you do where, you know, you're trying to hit your tib anterior, bro? People sometimes ask like, hey, how do I hit my tibialis anterior? And my first question is, why do you care? And the real answer physiologically is both the anterior part of the calf and the anterior part of the forearm are really small muscles that just aren't very growth prone. They're designed primarily for endurance. They're, uh, gee whiz, you know, you can pound them into oblivion using these same principles and I promise you they'll change very little and you'll be really upset. So most of your form training should be curling first. Second, you wanna find the rep ranges in which those good exercises provide the best stimulus judged by your mind-muscle connection. Like some form curls, you're like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, my elbows hurt. Some mind-muscle connection is crazy. You're like, oh my God, I feel like my forearms are gonna explode. If you get a ball or forearm pump, that's a really good thing. And of course, disruption to where someone's like, hey, grab that can of Coke right after you did like five sets of curls for forearms. And you're like, I, I can't, I can't physically grip anything anymore. Or you drop your phone talking to someone or something. You crash your car while driving on the freeway. Gee, that got dark really fast. Hopefully not that latter one. But in any case, mind-muscle connection, pumps and disruption, make sure they're there. Don't just go through the motions. If you go through the motions and someone's like, hey, is your forearm training feeling good? You're like, I don't know, is it supposed to feel like anything? You wouldn't say that about any other muscle. Don't say it about forearms as well. Train them frequently. Three to six sessions a week is a good idea because they recover really fast. Much less is probably not a good idea. And here's the thing. If you take forearm growth seriously, say it, say it yourself in your head, masturbation joke, then, you know, doing it once a week's not uh, probably going to cut it. You know, like the quads, if you disrupt them once a week, they take a long time to recover. Their growth curves last a long time. It'll probably work. Forearm training once a week, that's probably not going to cut it. Are you really sore and weak for a week straight after forearm training? <laughs> Another amazing masturbation joke that I simply won't make because I'm better than that and so are you. But real talk, you can recover from that stuff fast so it's easy to do frequently and get better and better and better results. Lastly, and this is a big one, progress on purpose. It's kind of weird to think of forearms as a thing where you like hit a PR on dumbbell curls on the bench, but what is training other than a sequence of staggered PRs? Like if someone asks you, hey, are you pushing the pace in your forearm training? Are you trying to get a little stronger? Are you, are you um, making PRs? If you say like, I don't know, just kind of go in there and do it, don't be surprised if you have weak, puny, you know, forearms like Harry Potter or some shit. Never actually looked to see if his forearms are small, but certainly, of course, they are. It, you know, why would you do that to any other muscle, right? Can you imagine you, you say to someone, like, I want big quads, and they're like, oh, are you getting stronger on squats, leg press, and hacks? So I like, nah, I don't know. I don't keep track of the weight. Just go fucking in there and hammer shit. That's dumb. Don't do that for forearms. A huge overreaching point of this video 
is forearms and grip strength, like everything else, should be treated seriously if you're really serious about improving it. And what a lot of people do is they think of it as an afterthought, and then they're surprised that it's the muscle and strength is, ref is actually reflecting that, and it seems like an afterthought. Like if you always train your chest first and do everything, and you have a big chest, you always you train your forearms last or never, and you never keep track, and you're like, man, I can't get my forearms to grow. Shut the fuck up. What do you mean can't get? You haven't been trying. Try, and it'll happen. All right. Now, Grip strength training. We don't have a guide for this on the RP website as of the filming in this video. This is not likely we will because there's more important shit going on. But for that, we have this video. So a how many seven step process or seven checklist process to make sure you're doing the right thing. First, make sure you're doing hypertrophy work for forms, at least in phases. You don't have to do it all the time, but at least a few months here, a few months there, in between strength phase work, you're making the forearms meaty because you can have a really, really good grip with small forearms. It happens, but you usually need to be a genetic freak for that shit to happen. Most people, if you see a guy with forearms coming out with a shirt like this, he probably doesn't have a weak grip. The more muscle you can have that pulls on a joint, generally the more force you can produce. So if you have jacked forearms, grip training is just going to work much better for you. You're going to start doing your grip training for strength and you're going to be like, holy shit, I'm getting a ton of strength. Whereas if your forearms are puny, they're going to top out at some point. You're just going to need to put on more forearm size. Number two, dedicate time to grip-specific work. Okay, just deadlifting and just rolling with no chalk is not enough for max results for almost anyone. If you want strong grip, then yeah, using barbell movements with no chalk is a good idea, sort of, but here's the problem. It really limits at some point how much weight you can lift, and then all of a sudden, your deadlifts and your rows aren't getting as strong as they should be because every time you fail them, you're actually failing at your grip level and not at your back or your hips or anything else, and you're kind of robbing those muscles and those points of strength from expressing themselves fully and really reaching their potential. So just like with anything else, you know, you want to get a be better strength in your forearms, you're going to have to train them. You're going to have to train your grip very specifically, right? Next one, to that end of sp specificity, this one might blow some minds here. Do your grip work fresh. Maybe not always, but at least sometimes do it first or second in the workout. Don't do it as the fifth or sixth exercise or you're literally on your way out. And someone's like, hey, didn't you want to get bigger forearms and a stronger grip? And you're like, aha, uh -huh. I was just testing you to see if you remembered. And you sort of do an awkward walk around. You come up to some dumbbells and you're like, yeah, oh, that's it. Good to go. Preferably, you should do this training on days in which you don't do a lot of heavy pulling or before you do heavy pulling and then use VersaGrips or straps or a shitload of chalk to make sure you can still get heavy pulling work even though your grip is fatigued. Again, none of this is rocket science. I'm just here to remind you, if you want some serious shit to happen, you got to prioritize that shit. You can't just do it regular or sort of just be like, eh, I'll just do it at the end. You do shit at the end, you get end-like results, which is to say not great ones. The core of your training, highly recommended if you want to be able to better grip. Now, in this video, I'm not going to get into all the differences with vice grip and crushing grip and all this other stuff. We're just here talking technically about crushing grip, but it's the most general kind of grip and it transfers really well to your ability to grip barbells and everything else, crush soda cans, shake hands with people at a physical level of exertion that is wildly inappropriate for social interaction where like, you know, your ex-girlfriend's introducing you to her current boyfriend. He's like, makes a little bit more money than you. He's definitely handsome, uh, more, uh, he's taller and he's nicer. And she's like, oh my God, hey, Jake. Your name's Jake in this, by the way. Meet Robert, isn't he great? And you're like, hey, Robert. And you don't even grab his arm. You take out some chalk, put that shit on your fucking hand. You're like, hold on a sec. Get that chalk going. Like, wait, wait, Robert, we'll get to you. We'll get to you, you gotta warm up. <sighs> Ammonia cap. <sighs> ah! And then as soon as you go for a handshake, if he hasn't run away at this point, don't just go and shake his hand. You got to set it up, right? So it's awkward to do myself. But if you get his hand, you got to set it in, right? Set it in like this and go, all right, we're shaking hands now, right? He's like, yeah, I guess we are. And you're like, ah, and you try to break his fingers. Bones fly everywhere. Blood. Your ex-girlfriend, his current girlfriend's like, oh my God, Jake, this is why we broke up. Ah, but then you can go home. You go on Reddit and type out the story to all your friends on Reddit, as awkward as that is to say. And, and then you're the man. Where the hell were we? Oh yes, grippers. So crushing grip is sweet for shit like that. And grippers are really good at doing that. What the fuck is a gripper? Go on ironmind.com. They have a series called Captains of Crush Grippers. They have every kind of gripper you can imagine and they're graded. They're all numbered. There's like a pansy gripper, <laughs> training gripper, student gripper, 
and then there's the Iron Mind, like number one, number two, number three, number four. Uh, number four is there's a list of people, maybe like fewer than 50 have ever closed it in the world. I sure as hell never do it. Number three, I think you get a certificate if you close it on camera and you send it to them. The number two, I've closed the two and a half, uh, which is like a pretty impressive, corresponds with like a six to 650 pound deadlift with chalk. If you can close the two and a half, generally you can pull that much if your, your grip won't fail. And all the way down the line, all the way to Pansy Gripper. They don't have one that's called a Pansy Gripper. They should, that'd be really funny. It's really easy to close. It's like, like bending a credit card or something. But grippers are great for a few reasons. One, they're standardized. To, so, so you know the resistance level and you know it's the same tool every time and you can thus progress and track your progress. Another one is they are, allow for full range of motion, which is probably how you want to be strong. You know, you don't want to be strong like right here and then you do a combat sport or something, jiu-jitsu, and someone bends your, you know, fingers back like this when they're passing and you're like, oh, I'm actually not strong here at all as I've never trained that part of the range of motion. So it gives you a, a full range to train your grip. And uh, it's nice and well knurled, so it's really uh, good for grip training and my best recommendation to you is how to do the repetitions here. And, and oh, sorry, last thing, you can do reps with them. Because if you just grab dumbbells and hold, you have to like time it or some shit. And like, when do you fail? Is it when your dumbbell falls out completely or when the grip starts to slip a little bit? Who knows? Here, if you, you know, do nine reps and you fully close the gripper and you do the 10th rep and it doesn't close, it's easy. It's just like a barbell lift. You can track it. Uh, the failure is really easy. The technique is super easy to standardize. My recommendation, huge for you to make this simple and easy on yourself. Mm, I shouldn't have said easy. Simple and honest is to go from fully opened gripper or as far as your fingers will open without it slipping out all the way to fully closed. And that means the two metal pieces at the end visibly and audibly clank. Hold that closed position for one full second at least and then slowly eccentric release and then go back. It's going to be hard. It's going to suck, but it's going to work and you're going to get a huge grip strength. And then when Robert dares come back and shake your left hand, he's like, hey, we're cool, right? You're like, totally, I'm totally over. That was crazy what I did last time. Snap that motherfucker's hand up. Just pull all his fingers out. It'll be amazing. And your girlfriend's like, oh my God, ex-girlfriend, but she's still your girlfriend in your own head. And that's really the problem, folks. All right. What about how to do the actual grip work itself? Okay, so we got the technique down. I would recommend sets in the 10 to 20 rep range and sets in the 5 to 10 rep range. Hold on a second. We said strength. Yes, but gripping has such a small amplitude that the reps don't take very long. And thus, as far as time under tension, area under the curve is concerned, sets of 5 to 10 for grip work really corresponds to sets of like 2 to 6 for any other current barbell movement, curling movement, so on and so forth. So I would recommend more sets of five to 10, 10 to 20. You actually get better strength like that. If you want to peak your grip strength at any point, you can do sets of, you know, one to five, but that should be pretty rare. Also, sets of one to five in the gripper tend to beat the shit out of all your, like, tendons and shit back here in your elbow and sometimes even, you know, closer to the wrist. It doesn't feel good. Try it. If it feels good for you, fine. But my recommendation is mostly sets of five to 10 and 10 to 20. And you have to remember one thing. Training grip is not the same thing as testing it. Yeah, they do give you a certificate if you close the number four gripper once, but you don't get strong closing grippers once. Uh, you see a lot of folks, you know, they have grippers at some of the more serious gyms. They have them laying out and you can come up and, and do them. Most people come up and they go, clink, oh, I did it. And they do it one or two times. They get tired. They throw it away. You're here. Use this as a training program. So you get the lighter grippers that you can do for reps and you do reps and alternate and reps and sets and all that stuff. You're building a grip. You're not testing it. There's a time for testing and testing is not the best way to build. Point number six, related to an earlier point about hypertrophy, seek progress, which means on a given gripper, you ought to add reps. Last week, you were doing sets of roughly six. Now you're going to do sets of roughly seven. Next week, hopefully roughly eight. When you get tired and you can't make PRs anymore, it's time to deload just like you would with any other exercise. Take a half a week or a week of much easier training, sometimes no grip training at all, then come back and start ratcheting up again. You have to go on purpose right into the flames and, and try to make more and more repetitions out of the stuff. If you have some kind of grip device at a gym, sometimes they have these where it's plate loaded. As long as your technique is standard, throw another two and a half on that motherfucker every now and again again, and your grip will get stronger over time. Don't just do the gripper and just do the gripper. Do, like, oh yeah, I did some grip. You know, you write in your notebook, you're like squats, five by 10, eccentric speed, blah, blah, deadlift, six by eight, blah, blah, eccentric speed, grip, check. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? You just go in there and do that and throw them away. No, no. Regimented, purposeful PRs with good technique is the way to do it. Now, what about other modalities? 
Farmer's walks, grip holds, grip rolls, and stuff like that. Are they good? Of course they're good. I would recommend more of the grip rolling type of stuff because it has a dynamic component versus just isometric. Just holding simply doesn't incur as many adaptations in almost anything as a dynamic approach because dynamic stuff makes you good at isometric and it makes you good at the dynamic. Isometric stuff does make you good at the dynamic stuff, but not nearly as much. Find a way as well to track progress. Again, don't just do some farmer's walks. Do farmer's walks for a prescribed time or a prescribed distance with a prescribed load. Next week, go up and up and up, deload up and up and up. And that way, you're going to be able to figure out, first of all, am I actually progressing? Good to know. And second of all, oh my God, I've progressed a lot. And I know for a fact my grip is stronger. I don't have to know. Because sometimes if you just fuck with the grippers or do some farmer's walks, someone can ask, hey, like, is your grip strength improving? And you're like, I think so. I've missed fewer deadlifts. Maybe my hitching is better. Maybe my technique is better. Maybe my forearm fatigue when I'm pulling is better, so on and so forth. Maybe I just started masturbating less before deadlift sessions, which I'd recommend as good advice anyway for life. All right, last point. The biggest factor in all of this is to set up and take your forearm and grip training as seriously as you do any other muscle group you want to grow. Not an afterthought, not just do some grip after rows. Select the best exercises, execute with good and stable technique. It's easy on grippers to week one, do good technique, and week two, you're like, ah, shit, I need sets of eight, (laughs) and you get it done. Train often, okay, more often usually than than just once a week or twice a week, maybe three times, maybe more, whatever you can recover and progress with. Train harder over time, which means tracking your progress to make sure you reach those sort of little increases in progress that guarantee that not only are you making progress, but you're pushing yourself psychologically to make those. Recover and repeat. TLDR, grip training and form training is like anything else, except it just looks a little strange and you're giggling a lot because all these masturbation jokes are the only thing you think about, which is what I think about all day. As soon as I say bye, I'll be thinking about masturbation. I hope you will as well. Bye.